Maya, how are you doing today? Doing well. I'm really pleased to be here, Ryan. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to, to get you on the show. We um, have had a lot of different people as we've been talking about what does a life after business mean? What does it mean to be involved? And I think there's this big question of what does it actually truly mean to be involved? Um, and I, I'm excited to hear your perspective because you're you're interacting with entrepreneurs on a daily basis and um, you also could use a lot of the different variety of it. But before we kind of jump into the, the meat of the conversation, just kind of curious for our listeners' sake, can you take us back to the time where you decided to jump into the nonprofit world? Sure. Um, I had worked in the for-profit world in marketing and advertising for 13 years, and then I was home with kids for six years, and I got my master's at the same time, and really wanted to do something different, and so really relied on the concept of transferable skills which I'm assuming your entrepreneurs would find very helpful too. You know, just because you had worked in one certain area does not mean that those skills don't translate really well actually to nonprofits. So going through my master's program, I did a lot of exploration of what kind of work I would like to do and really settled on making a difference through um, the fundraising aspect of nonprofits. So worked in um, two different healthcare philanthropy departments, and then came to Make a Wish about 16 months ago. Wow, that's pretty cool. I, uh, I transferable skills. I, I really like how you how you coined that, or you just articulated because yeah, that is. I mean, it's what I think. There's so there's so much uh, assumption that once you go in and you get this career and you do what you're doing for a long time, and now you just have to continue doing just that. But I think you're. Um, so what was transferable from the from the marketing and uh, advertising world to what you're doing now? And how, how did you kind of go through that process? Sure. So I think the number one skill um, that I think is, is very transferable is relationship building. So even though I say I'm in fundraising, fundraising is really about creating relationships with different people and different factions. And I did that leading an advertising group where I was working with clients, I was working with vendors, and all of those relationship building skills are essential when you are in the fundraising arena. So just as entrepreneurs might work with vendors or they might work with people internally at their own companies, those are relationship skills that can transfer to nonprofits. Um, Another one was managing people, and we all know that that can be the greatest joy or the biggest challenge uh, when you're working with people. (laughs) Depending on the day, um, what you think is really important, they might not think uh, is that important and vice versa. And so just really being able to manage people, and that transfers into fundraising as well, because it may be that an entrepreneur would want to come in and, let's say, lead um, a big fundraising gala. You are working with volunteers who don't have to work with you, um, but your ability to manage expectations, to work with people, to set clear guidelines, um, to have people follow through on what they said they would do, all of those are skills that I use coming to the nonprofit world and that entrepreneurs could use as they go into some kind of fundraising leadership role. Well, that's awesome insight, and I think that leads into kind of one of my one of the main questions why I'm so excited to to have this conversation because, um, and I'll I'll give the the listeners a little bit of a backdrop on on how we came to to the conversation because you and my dad have gotten to have conversations and through the business that we used to have. Um, I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs where, I mean, you get phone calls all day long, whether it's to the golf outings or to the local fire department or, you know, whatever charity it is that you've kind of been, you know, just writing writing the checks and feeling good about it, you know, somewhat involved, you know, emotionally or whatever it is that it is that you've come across that and you've got these vendors that you can always rattle for, you know, additional cash or whatever it might be. You've got this whole platform of resources to make kind of the ends meet and, um, I think trying to reframe like what does that involvement look like as you shift outside of necessarily just writing your own check and having the ability to understand what, what are those different types of involvements look like as you just kind of mentioned, like you're talking about a gala. I mean, what are some different ways that you see entrepreneurs or business owners transferring into some other roles? Sure. Um, So one of the things that I really encourage people to do is really think about either when they're still working as an entrepreneur in their company or as they're transitioning out, 
really have a great idea of what it is you want and what it is that is important to you. So for instance, um, and I'm not gonna name any names, but we work with uh, an architecture firm. And one of the things that we go to them on is we ask them to support us on wishes like backyard play sets. And so they're an architecture firm, you know, they do multi-million dollar buildings, but their architects were so thrilled to be able to be able to actually um, put together a plan where they could drop a backyard place that into a um, young girl's uh, backyard in Southeast Minneapolis. So it was, you know, there were city regulations, there was a garage to deal with, there was limited space, but it gave them an opportunity to kind of bring joy back to the work that they do. Architects, um, you know, kind of get pigeonholed and go down one particular road. And so to be able to actually go back to, you know, probably their seventh grade notebooks where they were sketching things that they thought were cool <laughs> was really fun for them. Um, but that was a way that that <clears throat> entrepreneurial firm could tie in with us. So really looking at what are your goals and objectives? Um, I think we have the best mission in the state and in the country um, because of a number of reasons. First of all, we deal with kids, um, mm -hmm. kids that are critically ill. And so we have an opportunity through our partnerships for our donors to be able to make their wishes come true. So it's not kids that are dying necessarily, but it's kids who have critical illnesses. So we actually, many of them go on to, um, you know, to have long, useful lives. And for them, getting this wish is really impactful and kind of turns their life around, gives them something to look forward to. So I think that's one of the reasons we're great. Um, we also have kids of all different kinds of disabilities or issues. So we're not just cancer or we are not just cardiology issues. So when someone is looking for a nonprofit to partner with, um, do you really want to be associated with only one issue? So if you have, let's say you have um, 50 people in your company, you may have one person who has dealt with breast cancer, for instance, but you may have 49 other people that have all sorts of things that they'd want to work on. And so to have a variety of diagnoses for these kids, I think is very helpful. And then the third piece is we are international. So if you have a business that you think may expand, you know, it may just be in Minnesota and you could work just with Make-A-Wish Minnesota. But let's say you have a couple offices in uh, Wisconsin or in South or North Dakota we have the ability to partner with you across all of your, your areas, even if you're international. We have 62 domestic chapters, 40 international chapters. So really look for a charity that makes sense for your organization, but also is in your geographic area, or you could expand it if you wanted to, because you don't wanna be um, tied to just one specific Minnesota charity, for instance, when you expand and then you have to look for another partner. Well, it, it's really interesting because um, you pretty much hit the nail on the head for me when I was when I was thinking about because as I was transferring out and I was uh, I think I had mentioned to you that I had you know was looking I had like a list of like 15 20 charities and it's tough to think about the topics you know like when yep. you're actually okay I know I want to help. I, I don't know exactly what in what form or fashion. And you know, as an entrepreneur, I, I can probably speak on the general, you know, the in general terms that entrepreneurs like to solve complex problems or you know, have creative problem solving and make a difference. And what's interesting, what you just said is that I mean, yeah, the Make a Wish. I mean, you got kids, but then it's every single problem, whether it's diseases or issues or anything. So you can almost tackle anything, can't you? Yes, you really can. And I think, you know, you want to look for something that has universal appeal, not only from um, kind of a business perspective. So for instance, one of the things, um, our kids uh, have four different kinds of wishes. They can have a wish to go, a wish to have, a wish to be, or a wish to meet. Um, one of the most common is a wish to go. So for instance, the child may say, um, I really want to go to um, the national yo-yo competition. And uh, so we partner with a local airline. Nationally, we partner with several airlines, but we partner with a hometown airline that really works with us on how can their um, customers give back, um, either on board or via miles. So that's a really natural connection. So that's another thing. You want to look for natural connections with your business. 
Um, you also want to look at what are the variety of ways that you can get involved. So, for instance, when you're with a larger organization, um, Make-A-Wish Minnesota, um, we have a variety of different committees that people can be on. So, Ryan, if you and I met, and first of all, I would always call you back. Uh, we do, we are very good <laughs> about calling Appreciate people that. back when they <laughs> reach out um, because you never know what kind of relationships might develop out of that. So, you know, we would sit down and I would say to you, okay, so here's how we're structured. We have um, between 250 and 300 kids that we serve each year. We've got a variety of wishes um, and we would, you know, connect on that. But here are the ways that you could get involved. We have volunteer opportunities. We have um, community members that serve on our committees and we have board membership. So those are just three of the ways. And then we would talk about what are your interests? Because the most important thing when you're meeting with anybody new who wants to get involved with your organization is what is it that they're hoping to get out of it? Um, just as networking is always a two-way street, uh, it's also important to know that board members want to get something out of it. It may be um, you know, that they want to make a difference, make an impact. It may be that they've got volunteer time they wanted to use. It may be that they want to move their business forward by partnering and showing that partnership. Um, we've got a um, appliance company that we're working with that has um, given us the opportunity to be more and more visible. We've actually got an event that we hold at one of their stores. And you would think, what, an event, you know, in the middle of an appliance store? It works beautifully. Um, it's called Wine, Women, and Wishes. And it's an event that we have where we have several hundred women across the Twin Cities come. It's upscale shopping. Um, there's wine tasting, there's food, and we have wish kids come. So they come, it gives uh, the people an opportunity to interact with the wish kids, get to know their stories and understand more about the organization. So it's really important that you look for an organization that has a variety of opportunities and meets you where you are. Um, you can always grow that relationship, but it may be that you want to do a strategic plan Okay, did they just finish it a year ago? If, if so, it may not be the right organization or the right time. Um, I would stress that you should get to know a little bit about the organization, go to their website, um, call and talk to you know, their CEO. Um, but really important that you kind of know what you're interested in and that they can give that to you because ultimately it's not gonna be a fruitful, fruitful relationship if it's one-sided, if it's just being asked for money and you're not getting anything out of it in return. I think you, wow, that was extremely insightful because um, it, some of the you addressed some of the challenges that I know that um, I see that I've experienced also with uh, other uh, individuals and the members or the the listeners that we've got. Where so as an entrepreneur, really, when you say it, and I, I can I can only under, um, see how you deal with this and this challenge of. If the entrepreneur doesn't know what they want, how do you make how do you meet them where they are? Where is it is it is it the pocketbook or do you want to volunteer or do you want to be on the board? Um, there's a, an association that we call Halftime. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. I'm not. So they Halftime is about how to move from success to significance, and there's a lot of introspective questions that you need to ask. Like, what is it that actually makes me tick? Am I a creator? Am I a builder? Am I someone that likes to give my time? And mm -hmm. trying to figure out who you are first before then you go ask something of like an organization like yourself. Right, right. You know, and one of the ways that we do this is we really make sure that people know, you know, for, for instance, if we're bringing on a new board member, we are very clear about what the expectations are so that there's no surprises once the person starts. We have a, um, a dollar commitment that's linked to wishes. We have a certain number of board meetings that we want them to attend. We want them to serve on a committee. Um, so, you know, it's really clear the expectations from the start. But then each year we sit down one-on-one -on -one with our board members and we have what's called a partnership contract. And within the partnership contract, there's a ton of different opportunities. So it may be that they really want to do um, social media fundraising. So for instance, uh, we have two walks. We have the Twin Cities Walk for Wishes and we have the Duluth Walk for Wishes. It may be that they've got a ton of connections. They came from Duluth and they want to do fundraising for that. Mm -hmm. So that would be one of the opportunities. So we have events, um, we have introductions, 
We have um, ability to you know, be on different committees. Uh, one of the key things that we look at, and this is um, coined from many my many years of working in fundraising, we want people to do to be one um, of three different things, and and oftentimes they are more than one: a doer, a door opener, or a donor. Hmm. Now, um, depending on what role you take on, you could be all three. Uh, but a doer, for example, may be somebody who doesn't have the financial capacity and doesn't want to be on the board, but they may love um, doing galas. So, you know, we've got fabulous people from florists to um, audiovisual people that work with us each year. And uh, many of them are donors as well, but they really put together an amazing gala. Um, a door opener. We hope that everyone can do this. So entrepreneurs, I think this is where probably many of your entrepreneurs were, would excel. Um, we've got the ability uh, to create more relationships. The more people from different spheres that we can bring on, the more we can expand the presence and the knowledge about Make-A-Wish. When I sit down with people, I tell them there's three common misperceptions. Um, the first is that everybody dies, and fortunately 70% or more of our kids survive their diagnosis. The second is that everybody goes to Disney World, and that's not true as well. And then the third is that we're rolling in money, and um, all nonprofits are going to have the desire to uh, be fundraising. So it's important to know um, that coming from an entrepreneurial role or a for-profit role, that um, donations are integrally important in, um, in any nonprofit. So that door opening role is really crucial. Um, we just had a great example. We got together many of our volunteers for a breakfast and we had 15 people in the room that had collectively done 5% of all wishes ever done. We just hit our 5,000th wish. Wow. And so these were people who had really done a ton of wishes. And one of them came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, I know a guy from my church. He's uh, working for a... Um, IT computer company, and he would really like to get involved. I met him uh, about two weeks later, met him for lunch, and now we've got a lot of kids. One of those wishes is a wish to have. Um, this child wants computer equipment, and this organization is thrilled to get involved because it's their mission, it's you know, it's their product, and they're going to offer us the opportunity to have wish kids come and design what they want from computer equipment that they already have. Oh, cool. So, yeah, so it's a very great partnership. So that was a door opening that was done by a volunteer that works for us. And then the final is always donor. Um, you know, we've got a number of ways to give. We've got a car donation program called CARS, so people can go to our website and they can donate any kind of vehicle, a boat, a boat trailer, um, an RV, um, and so that's a way to give back. You can also give airline miles. Many of the entrepreneurs probably would love to be able to take the airline miles that are sitting unused. Maybe they always fly American, but they've got Delta miles that are unused. Mm -hmm. um, those do just wonders for us because we would need 75 million miles every year in order to get our kids on their wishes to go. Wow. So tons of ways to get involved. And it's all about what the, you know, the person coming to us really wants to engage on. Well, in, in I've never seen an organization that does as uh, does this as dynam dynamically, excuse me, as you do because you know I I know that entrepreneurs their biggest fear. So as we're talking about transitioning, whether and, and this is whether they you know whether we're selling today or down the road or whatever, it's a transition emotionally and and the most crucial part in an identity of who you are and. The biggest fear, I know this coming from personal experience, like the biggest fear when you sell or transition out of your company that you're going to become irrelevant and that people are just going to knock on your door for just the money. And I think what you, what, you know, the way that you articulate the, the different buckets, the doing or the door opening is like we, you know, we had all these con contacts and customers, like how do I leverage that? How do I benefit someone else for that? Or like the skills that you learn. And I think it's, um, you, you, you had, a really good statement when you said meeting where you're at, but then trying to figure out what you want and then how, like like the uh, strategic plan that you mentioned. Yeah, if they've just right. done it, then don't go try and do another one, but try and figure out how you can, you know, engulf your skills with the current organization. Exactly. And, you know, I'll give you another example. We have a great community member who came to us 
he was on the development committee and the development committee is all about fundraising. And he said, you know, I really don't like committees. I've done a number of meetings over the years. He's a <laughs> successful businessman. And he said, you guys don't have a golf tournament right now. We did. And then it had fallen away. And we said, no, we don't. He goes, I will lead that. I will find the place. I will find the vendors. I will organize the foursomes. And so he is taking that with a small group of people. He doesn't come to the development committee because he hates meetings. So he is <laughs> he's leading that fundraiser for us, which we expect to be really successful. It's going to happen this September. So that's an example of he came to us. He said, this is what I am interested in. This is what I'm not interested in. And we met him where he is. He's being incredibly helpful. And we're so appreciative for his skills in that area. That, that That's an awesome example. So what, you know, as you're as you're meeting with individuals like that, like what kind of freedom do you give or how, like how do you engage with that kind of conversation to, to really draw out how to utilize it? Right. Well, I think one of the things is a really good set of ears. Um, you know, they, there's that old joke that we've got two ears and one mouth and you should use them proportionally. And I think really sitting and listening to not only what they say, but the underlying pieces of it, what is it that they're trying to get out? What is it that they feel like they're lacking um, I've got a spouse who just retired, so I'm intimately acquainted with, you know, what's the next part of right. what's the next part of life? What do I do next? How do I stay engaged? How do I stay relevant, as you said? And um, so I think really trying to listen to them and then try and know your organization well. Me as a as a nonprofit leader, know your organization well enough to say, you know what, we've got a great spot for you, or you know what, in six months we're going to really need you. Um, one of the things that we've heard from people is they would love to speak on behalf of make Push. So we're starting an ambassador program oh, cool. where we have people who are highly skilled, who probably have done wish granting. We have um, wish granters across the state who actually work directly with the family and the kid. Um, and so they are going to become ambassadors for us. We've got a lot of people who do wonderful fundraising for us. And we as a small staff can't be at every event. You know, there's, there's um, motorcycle rallies and there's, um, you know, salon events that they're doing and there's, um, you know, schools that are doing things. So we really have to parse out where we can have our staff uh, located or we'd be, you know, out every weekend. So we're trying to train ambassadors, so that we've got people who, who can go out and speak on behalf of make -A So that's another example. That's really of just cool. Understanding the, the people we have. So uh, that, that's, that's really, really Really cool because, I mean, you're going to be able to plop someone into their passions into a spot that they want and they'll be able to own it and you'll be able to accomplish a lot of things at once. Exactly. So that kind of leads me to this question. Like, Can you kind of give us a rundown of what's a typical year look like? You know, what is the makeup of the structure but then also the events that you do? And, I mean, I truly love – my wife and I, when we had our twins, we were on, on the same level with the Ronald McDonald House. So I was watching all this stuff go in and out, and I cannot imagine the different topics that you guys are uh, challenged with every year. But give us the kind of the, the lay of the land on an annual basis for you guys. Sure. Um, so we do between 250 and 300 wishes on average each year. And um, – each wish takes probably nine to 12 months. So that whole process, the way it comes in is we have a referral process. So kids can be referred by themselves, their parents, or some kind of a healthcare worker. So many times it comes through a physician at Children's Minnesota or at Masonic Children's Hospital, um, you know, something like that. We serve kids from all over the state. We have national guidelines on how wishes qualify. So it has to be a life-threatening medical condition, and uh, there are behind-the-scenes kind of pieces on what qualifies and what does not, but it is consistent nationally, and it is determined by questions asked by Make-A-Wish America. So we don't ever have to be in the uncomfortable position of saying you qualify or you do not. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, we are constantly looking at what qualifies as critically ill for children, and um, HIV and AIDS both qualified years ago, and now because HIV is seen as a chronic illness, just children who have AIDS and AIDS diagnosis are qualified. So we do a lot of behind the scenes work. So as you can imagine, to um, really create one a child's one 
life-changing wish. We really pull out all the stops to make that happen. And we really spend a lot of time trying to understand what the child's wish is. It's not the parent's wish as much as they would sometimes (laughs) like it to be. Um, It truly is the child's wish. So the example I gave earlier of the young man who wanted to go to the national yo-yo competition, he was so into yo-yos. And (laughs) that was perfect for him. We had another young man who wanted to go to the Jet Propulsion Lab in California. Um, He had loved engineering since he was a young child. He um, had a disability that made it so that he was in a wheelchair. And when he got back, he talked about the impact on him and being able to kind of associate with those people um, and how life-changing it really was. We had another example that we were just featured on WCCO television last week for our miles drive. And there was an example of a young man who had a wish to be a pilot when he was 14. He is now 29 and he is a pilot for SkyWest. So yeah, really fabulous wishes. So wishes drive everything we do. Um, We put together a budget and make sure that we've got enough money coming in. We work with individuals We work with schools, we work with corporations, we work with foundations. We do not receive any government money, and it's all solely driven on um, donations. We also have a variety of events. So we have the golf tournament, which will be the first um, coming up in September. We also have a walk coming up August 5th in the Twin Cities and October 1st in Duluth. Um, Our wish ball, which is our annual gala, is coming up at the Minneapolis Hilton on May 20th, and tickets are still available for that. Um, So those are all ways that we kind of bring in the money. And so we're all structured around making sure that a child's one life-changing wish happens and uh, putting everything into place to make sure that that happens behind the scenes. So that... How when you're when that's a lot of wishes by the way every year and especially if they're taking twelve or nine to twelve months and yep. you're thinking and I'm just trying to think of like just the random stuff that you I mean just <laughs> the two examples you gave how do you put a budget in place I mean how do you leverage your contacts to make all that stuff happen mm-hmm. well the beautiful thing and one of the things I love most about Make a Wish Minnesota is I am part of a team of sixty one other colleagues across the country that help determine best practices. So we have been in business now for 35 years. We're um, just celebrating our 35th year this year. And so we've got a lot of track records. So we actually figure out the cash cost and the in-kind cost of of an average wish and have that over many years. We also compare ourselves with other like-sized chapters and uh, really try to stay within that. Um, So as I mentioned, there's a cash cost, which we need donations for, but there's also an in-kind cost. And so that is things like the architects that donated their time on the Playhouse Wish, or it may be um, that someone has, uh, we had a child who wanted a golf cart um, because he had limited mobility and wanted to be able to get around. We actually had a community member who had an extra golf cart that they weren't (laughs) using that was pretty much brand new. And that became, um, you know, a a 100% donation for that in-kind wish. We also have a lot of wishes that really um, are not very expensive. So it may be that they want to meet someone. We had a fabulous wish on March 5th. It was our 5,000th wish. And it was Carter Casey's wish to meet the Minnesota Wild. So um, we work in partnership with the Wild, the Twins, um, the Lynx, the Timberwolves, the Vikings. Um, The Minnesota Wild just did a fantastic job. Carter got to sign a contract for a day with their coach. He got to tour the locker room. He got to meet his favorite player. He got fabulous seats. He got to get a tour beforehand. My favorite part was he got to press the goal buzzer, um, (laughs) which was really, really fun. Um, and you know, so we've got partners out there that help bring our in-kind costs in line. Um, but we're always looking for more, um, more people who can donate things, um, more organizations that might have things that we need. You know, uh, one of the things we get sometimes is makeovers for rooms and as silly as it sounds, we need donations of beds, things like that. Um, you know, so all of those things kind of play into keeping our costs as low as possible. Mm-hmm. What, what, just kind of from my own personal curiosity, like when you're having these requests that are just all over the spectrum from, you know, 
meeting people to doing things to you know physical goods how do you like how do you notify your community of because you you could leverage you could probably just leverage everybody that's in your community is there certain ways that you guys go about doing that already Yes. So, you know, for many things, we do have partners. We have um, Sun Country Airlines is a fabulous partner with us. Uh, they waive all luggage fees. They waive all change fees. Um, so that's an example. And many of our wishes are wishes to go. But occasionally we have things like we just had a young man who wanted um, to have access to his um, like his porch or his patio. And he was in a wheelchair and couldn't physically get to Um, to that area of his house. So we had a vendor who volunteered to create a door from his bedroom out onto the patio so that he could actually get out there. And we got that through social media. We, uh, we use um, mn.wish.org is our website. And we post a lot on Facebook, on Instagram. So we're always putting those opportunities out there. We also have Every month, um, I put out to our community members and our board members, so those that are closest to us, and that's a group of about 45 people, I put out um, kind of our urgent in-kind needs. Um, We do have rush wishes occasionally, and a rush wish either means that a child may be getting, for example, we just had one where a child is getting a bone marrow transplant, and so will be unavailable to do a wish for several years. Or we do have some children that are going to pass away, And we want to try and get the wish as quickly as we can. Um, We had one in the northern part of the state and it was so far away and it was such a rush. We actually called on our Make-A-Wish North Dakota chapter and they went over and met with the family and determined uh, what the wish would be and got that to happen in a really quick manner. Wow. That's really, I mean, you guys have, you guys have really gotten the system down and it's really it's really encouraging because of how you're leveraging all the relationships and that you're allowing the, the different um, participants and entrepreneurs and people that you're working with to contribute. And I think the biggest challenge that I, I mean, I ran into and I've heard other people is it's the no, or you just, there's this perception that you just need to like go hand out bag lunches, you know, and that's, right. that's how you're, it's either that or your checkbook. So, I mean, the, the amount of possibilities that you just threw out, I mean, I mean it's, it's huge. What, what are um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you guys have? You know, I, I think one of the biggest challenges is um, getting enough money to make sure that we're granting every, every eligible wish. So what you'll find is there are great opportunities and ways to get engaged, and all of those help drive resources. And so opening the door, you know, so for example, I'll give you um, a great one. We had a board member we were talking about opening the door for us to other types of people. This board member works in the wealth management area. They had a person come in and say, you know, I really love to give back to children, but I don't know which organization would be the best to do that. They fostered an introduction. I met with the person. The person had just taken over as in a leadership role at um, an electric company. And that person said, you know what? I would love to do any pool or spa hookup that you have. So Kids will oftentimes um, ask for a backyard spa or a backyard pool, not because they want to splash around, but because it's part of their therapy. Mm -hmm. And so one of the biggest costs of those types of wishes is the electrical hookup. And you would never think about that um, until you've actually done one yourself. And so (laughs) this organization um, was able to do that and, um, you know, gives us a certain amount of hookups each year. So those are the kinds of things. Um, But what I will say is for for every nonprofit leader in the Twin Cities, money is always a big issue. Um, There's never enough to go around. Um, And so we're always compromising and we try to never compromise wishes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the biggest challenge for me is really making sure that we've got enough dollars coming in so that we don't have to delay kids. We don't turn down any eligible child, but sometimes, you know, it's, taking longer to get their wishes to happen. Um, So, you know, we want to try and shorten that because we do have some rush wishes and we do have kids that really want this as something to look forward to. So when you've got waiting wishes, that's what what weighs on my mind when I go home every night is, you know, how do I move this so we've got the right people in place and the right resources in place to make this child's wish happen? So if you're one of our listeners and you're looking at, 
some internal exploration of what it is and how can they get involved. Um, whether, yes. whether it's looking at the waiting wishes or being exposed to all of these 300 wishes every single year, mm-hmm. where, where's the best place to go get some exposure to the wishes that are coming out and then also outside from just the individual wishes that are happening for the contributions, but the more, I guess, uh, detailed conversation that you, you might have with them. What are the two different ways that uh, would be the best approach? Sure. So um, I would say the first place would be to go to mn.wish.org, Minnesota.org, and uh, just check out all of, you know, it tells a little bit about the story. Um, Make-A-Wish started 36 years ago. Um, our chapter started 35 years ago. And it started at, with one little boy. Um, and he wished to be a police officer in Arizona. And so Chris Gracious's story is on our website. And you can read that. That's where it came from. And it was people who got together and made something happen. This little boy got to ride in a police car and go in a helicopter and do things that no one individually could have made happen. Um, so start there. And then I would encourage people to connect with me personally. Um, my email is mhogberg, H-O-A-G-B-E-R-G, at wishmn.org. And I'd be happy to connect. And then I will also put all of the social media uh, stuff in the show notes for all the listeners because go on follow you on Facebook and Instagram, all that stuff. So that way they can be seeing the stuff that's that's coming across. Great. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for coming on the show.